Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I have Josh LaRose with me, and I'm Danielle Amasia. And today, Josh is going to take us through uh, deferral prevention. So how can we continue to weatherize jobs and prevent an excess of deferrals? And he has uh, been on a committee with the Department of Energy, and he's implementing some of those practices in his own state of Vermont. Uh, Josh, would you like to say hi or introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, hi everyone, and uh, and thanks Danielle, and, and by extension the entire Hancock team for hosting these uh, informative webinars and for uh, inviting us to present today. Um, just just one point of, of clarification. Um, so the the committee that Danielle was just referring to, um, it's a weatherization readiness committee um, that I believe. DOE um, and other stakeholders had asked um, to, to be started, and it's actually NASCAS that's facilitating um, those recurring meetings, and there are a number of states that are um, looking at the topic of, of deferral prevention and tracking and funding interventions to remove uh, barriers to receiving comprehensive weatherization services from a, from a number of different lenses. And, um, I've been fortunate enough to, to be a small part of that team and uh, have certainly learned a lot from uh, from my colleagues around the, the country. Um, and we're full of gratitude for, for those opportunities for peer exchange uh, and this one here today again. Um, so yeah, talking about deferral prevention and tracking. Awesome. And before we start, um, Andrea from NASCAS, Josh says thanks for being here to do this. <laughs> Um, I will yeah. let you know like when questions come up. I think everybody should be pretty familiar. I'm recording the session, so even if you have a colleague that can't attend and you want to share that later, as long as you signed up, you'll receive a recording. Um, I also, just in case, asked for a BPI number if you had it, and we'll see if this is eligible for credits. So I'll submit that after. I'm not sure if it's eligible or not, but we'll hear back. Uh, so that's really all I have, Josh. Go ahead. I'll just. Would you prefer like questions as you go along, or? Um, I, I think really, Danielle, if you could handle sort of the the facilitation, I I'm amenable to taking questions along the way, um, and or at the end, um, whatever your preference is as a facilitator, I'm game. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm not Let's known for for multitasking it. well as I'm talking and like pay attention to chats and things like that. So if you could monitor those. And, and interject when you feel it's appropriate. Let's roll with that. Okay, sounds good. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so just wanted to start um, by, excuse me, by zooming out and sort of looking at what's going on nationally um, within the context of deferrals and um, making investments into preventing them. Um, so, it certainly seems to be a well-established trend that there is a growing need to better track and report about deferred projects. And at the same time, it seems like there's more financial resources coming online um, and becoming more readily available to help prevent deferrals. So, um, you know, certainly when, when there's a need to provide more information about something, it's, it's always great when there's also um, some parallel funding coming along. So it's it's not just a reporting exercise, but we're actually reporting about um, increasing impacts. Um, and that's that's always an exciting thing to be able to do more to help vulnerable families. Uh, what's up locally? Zooming in a little bit. We're, we're in the, the small state of Vermont. Um, it's a big ditto. Um, the national trends are, are also uh, here and present in Vermont. And additionally, one thing that I just wanted to, to know was that here in Vermont's weatherization program, we have established an admittedly lofty goal of having no deferrals. Um, so while, uh, while having no deferrals may or may not prove to be a possible goal to achieve, that's what we're striving toward here in Vermont. And when we think about deferrals and, and just being able to track what's going on um, and ensuring that clients or prospective clients don't slip through the cracks, um, we really sort of just visited what 
have we done that's been successful in partnership with Hancock, um, who provides our data management system. And here on the screen, I just wanted to quickly outline what the various status points are along the way of what we consider the traditional WAP job process here in Vermont. So um, there may not be 100% alignment in terms of uh, terminology that you use for the various steps along the way, and there may or may not be alignment with all of these steps. Um, I, I think often in the national weatherization model, the first person that actually walks into a client home is the energy auditor, and the first in-person visit to occur is the energy audit. Here in Vermont, um, we have an additional step that actually happens before the energy auditor ever goes in, and we call that an efficiency coach visit. So our job process, um, starts with a coaching visit. And this is a quick bulleted list of what we see in our data management system um, as jobs progress from stage to stage along the way. And then we have uh, down here at the bottom, uh, we have the idea of a deferred job and the idea of a deferral resolution. And we'll circle back to those two things a little bit later in the presentation. So when, when we were looking at uh, a growing need to get more information at our fingertips about deferrals, we threw a lot of possibilities on the table about what do we really want to know. And we started with a really, really big list, and then we tried to winnow that down to what we considered the more essential data points. Um, that had the most um, likelihood to be used and, and, and therefore uh, the higher likelihood of, of being utilized consistently and in a reliably fashion, a, re a reliable fashion, excuse me. Um, so what we came up with was we really want to know, has a job been deferred? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty straightforward one, um, but it certainly makes the cut um, for the essential need to knows. Uh, then we, we really want to know what type of deferral. And we want to know why was a job deferred? Was it one reason? Was it multiples um, that together um, made up a, a reason to defer a job? Uh, what was the deferral date? When was that decision made and communicated to a prospective client? Then, once a job had been deferred, as there's a growing abundance of resources to remove um, the reasons for deferral, um, there's more jobs that are having deferral resolution. So, it's becoming increasingly important for any given job to know whether or not there was a deferral resolution, yes or no. And if yes, what was the date of that resolution? And when we know that the date that the deferral happened and we know the date that the deferral resolution occurred, um, we can extrapolate another thing that we felt was really important when we're trying to evaluate and manage and plan for um, better program operations. So um, we think knowing the deferral duration is, is also going to be really valuable from client to client so we can pick up on trends. So we had identified what we felt was important and uh, we had conveyed um, what we thought was important, why we felt it was important to, to our partners here at Hancock Software. And um, they were able to make some really nice enhancements to their data management system. So what you're seeing up on the screen now is what we would consider kind of one of our home base go-to screens within the data management system itself. Um, this screen is, is really cool because there's an abundance of information. Um, a lot of different columns of information. And then in the other axis of the grid, each row represents an individual job record. Um, this is a really versatile and configurable screen where every time you go in, you can drag the columns in whatever order you would like um, so that you can present the information in the way you want to see it in the moment. Um, and then you can process that information within 
the Hancock environment, or you could export it into an XML file, and it'll export um, in, in a mirrored presentation, whatever you have on the screen in the moment. So whatever order you put the columns in, that's how it's gonna export into Excel. Um, if you wanted the opportunity to uh, you know, run pivot tables or, or utilize some other features in Excel, um, to make use of the data. Um, so what we're looking at here are sort of columns of information that get at what we had identified as some of our important things to know. So right here, beside job number, um, which is just a nice identifier for every gig in the system, we can see in simple yes or no terms, is this job currently or has it ever been deferred? It's just yes or no, but it tells you yes or no for every job. If, if yes, what was the deferred date? So you have that information right there. And then what was the deferred reason? And you're not limited to one reason. Um, and that's a great thing because often there are more than one reason contributing to a deferral decision. So um, it presents whatever combination of reasons you've selected for an individual job here in a common separated list. So uh, this first one in the top row, you could see that um, some of the contributing factors to that deferral were bulk water slash moisture problems, um, the roof condition, and you can also see that it's been indicated that this is a deferral, but it's a deferral with a path forward, um, which is another nice thing to know, um, as opposed to a deferral with no path forward. Um, then we can see in the next column over, um, in this scenario, what we're looking at is a couple of jobs that also um, proceeded Josh, your volume is going in and out a little bit. I don't okay. know. Okay. Sorry. Do Sorry, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be still and and um, just to to let folks know. I hope I'm coming through decent. Uh, more often than not, um, I'm I'm calling in from Vermont and we do not get tornadoes. That's not a regular thing here, but there are uh, tornado warnings in this area today, and one just touched down towns away from me. So. Sorry, sorry if there's connectivity issues. I think like the beginning of your sentences are very clear and then it trails off. So interesting. Yeah, it, yeah you're very clear right now. Okay, well, I'll, I'll do my best not to, to move. Um, so these jobs on the screen were lucky. They had their deferrals resolved. So we get a yes in that column. Again, this would be yes or no answer based on the data entry that had happened on any given job. Um, and if yes, then it shows you the, the date of the deferral resolution. So um, it's kind of short and sweet. It, it's a compact grid, but there's a lot of um, powerful information there and it's easy to access. Josh, Susan from Vermont um, had a question about those deferral reasons that you're showing. Yeah. Is that path forward tied to like one of those reasons or both of those reasons, she asked. Um, yeah, thank you for, for asking. So we're sort of experimenting with this. So, so we added two choices to the list of possible reasons why something was deferred. One of those choices is deferral with path forward. And the other choice is deferral with no path forward. And neither of those are really reasons, um, but we felt by putting those on the list and giving people an opportunity to pick one or the other every time that that could give us a valuable indicator when we go to this reporting grid um, so that we could kind of um, get a visual indicator about which jobs are likely to be able to move forward at some point um, versus which jobs are, are probably gonna be stationary and in that deferral status for the long term. Um, so, so we were thinking we would just kind of use that as a visual indicator when we're when we're querying the database. So, Josh, like you're saying, the each of your jobs, if it's deferred, it'll have a deferral with a path forward or deferral with no path forward selected. Everything that's deferred will have one of those. Correct. That's how we're going to instruct our. Um, our local network to utilize the reasons list where it's pick pick any and all of the applicable reasons and make sure that you always pick one or the other about path forward. Um, 
either deferral with path forward or deferral with no path forward, just to give us a little bit more information about whether it's likely to be a short-term or long-term deferral. And in your case, the other reasons that show explain the deferral selection you selected, or are they related? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yep. Um, and then one, I, I do have a couple more images from the the software about this that I'm that I'm hoping will be useful. So let me let me fast forward to the next one. So there's a, only been a very subtle change in this image compared to the one on the last slide. All I did was I went into the deferred column and I picked the little funnel icon. And by picking that, it shows me my available choices, which in this case, it's just a yes, no answer. And then I clicked yes, and then I clicked the OK button. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna narrow down the results that show up on this job list screen. And it's only gonna show me jobs that have a yes answer for, is this job currently or has it ever been deferred? So if you look right now, I have a job list view that's showing me almost 18,000 jobs that we've processed through the Hancock environment. So we're looking at almost 18,000. I click those two buttons and now this is, this is the result. Um, that job list view, just based on those two clicks, now shows me out of those nearly 18,000 records, how many of those are currently or had been previously deferred and there's only 168. Um, so if I wanted to export this into an Excel file, um, it would show up exactly as it appears here. And now I'm only exporting the 168 records that I actually care about. I'm not exporting our entire database. Mm -hmm. And then Andrea asks, um, do you give a deferral letter with all conditions to fix to the client and then a time that it will be fixed? Like, are you giving any letters? So, so we do, um, in, in addition to regular conversation or phone calls, um, we also do have a, a more formalized requirement that if you are gonna be deferring a client, you have to provide them a written notification that the deferral decision has been made and why. Um, that letter may or may not indicate a time period um, for duration of deferral. Um, but we do try to work with clients to the extent possible to, to minimize deferrals and um, try to find additional financial resources to help remove whatever barriers come to this. Um, but yes, we do, we do send a letter. And then this was sort of like the reporting screen. And the next screen I want to show is for an individual client record. So it's actually this one right here in the top row, um, cv.wx.5918. So we're going to click into that job record, and I'll show you a screen grab of what that actual record looked like. So this screen is actually related specifically to that client. And for folks that do use Hancock software, this is probably a very familiar landing spot their audit information screen is the screen that loads when you first click into any hancock job um, so what hancock kindly did um, over time to enhance their deferral tracking capabilities is, is build in um, this small expansion within their site assessment table so you can see that when a job is deferred, it's as simple as just going to a page that you're always on anyway, if you're doing any sort of data entry for this client and checking a deferred box. And then there's sort of a, an expansion of the screen that happens at that point. As soon as you check the box, then the deferred date and the reason fields will show up on the screen for the first time so that you're able to type in the date that the deferral decision was made. And then out of this, this scrolling pick list, you're able to put a check beside every applicable reason uh, for why the deferral decision was, was going to be made. And then if the, if the job has just reached the point where it's been deferred and, and that's as far as it's gone, that's where you would stop with your data entry. If you ever were 
able to resolve the issue, then you would come back to the same spot. You would check the box that says deferral resolved, and then you would type in the deferral resolution date. It's really nice because it gives you the ability to track the entire arc of a deferral all the way through the resolution without having to erase the history that it was deferred and why, um, it, which, which would have been necessary if, if the Josh, you're breaking up like a, oh. just the last two sentences, the was deferred and why. Okay, were, thanks for letting me know. Now you sound very clear. <laughs> <laughs> I did, yeah, I'm sorry. It's it's really bad weather here. Um, sorry about this, everyone. It's strange that the beginning of your sentences are so clear, but it was really, it, we heard everything except just the last. So I, I'm just saying that the addition of the deferral resolve checkbox in the deferral resolution date, like when you see it on a screen, it doesn't look like that big of a deal, but it's actually very impactful because you're able to keep the history. You, you don't have to uncheck that the job was deferred in, in order to continue to move along. Um, you can still indicate that, yeah, this job was deferred. That's part of its history. And it deferred on this date and it was deferred for this reasons. You don't have to erase that information. You can just add to it. Um, and it's really nice to be able to, through some very simple um, solutions, be able to track the entire arc of, of a deferral all the way through its resolution. Would that ever be a future date, like a projected resolution date? Or are you in your state, are you going to require when it is actually resolved? Uh, for, for us, the way that we would operationalize the use of these features is that we would only do it after it had been in reality. We wouldn't use it as a projection date. We, we would make sure that we only type that this is resolved and this is the date it happened after it had occurred out in a home. Okay, there's another question. Yes. Um, this information is filled out at the local agency level. Was was this easy to impl implement? And are you getting consistent deferral info from the local agencies? Yeah, those are great questions. Uh, so in the spirit of transparency, um, these screen grabs are taken off our practice version of the website, and we have not launched this on our production server as of yet. Um, we have been able to track deferrals and the reasons why things have been deferred for, for some time now. Um, and that seems to be going okay. Um, but the deferral resolution um, add-on is, is new and we're about to launch that with our local network very soon. Um, we anticipate it going okay, um, but I can't, um, can't attest to that based on our, our experience because we haven't had the experience yet. What works best with your local network to adopt a new process like this with deferral resolve, deferral resolution date? What do you usually do? Do you do a training or? Um, so what we'll do is we'll we'll make a, a Hancock user guide um, that establishes what the features can do and how we want the new features to be used in our network. And then we'll we'll do um, some webinars um, about how to use them. And then we also have um, a contracted um, person who I believe is on the call, Tony Smith, um, who did the lion's share of the testing of, of these features as they were released over time and who also provides one-on-one -on -one support when people need it. Um, so when we launch new things, having Tony available to help people, um, when it's most applicable as they're actually trying to use things for the first time is really um, something that we've found invaluable mm -hmm. and hancock we can make a quick video for you too if you'd like to share with your network yeah that'd be awesome there are some more questions about weatherization readiness and everything you're showing but i think you're going to talk about that right uh yes okay go ahead yep so, so one one other thing that I just wanted to point out um, for for folks that are more familiar with Hancock, you may have already noticed this. Just looking at it for folks that don't use Hancock, um, 
the, the terms might not mean much to you, but if you look on this same screen grab, um, another thing that I boxed in in blue that has a little asterisk beside it, a red asterisk is the job status. Um, so as you'll see here, this job was marked as deferred, but that did not prevent the job from continuing to progress through the traditional job statuses. So um, when we looked back at that image earlier in the slide deck that had sort of like the swim lane that showed all of the job statuses um, available in Hancock, um, this job was able to continue to progress all the way through, um, even though it had been a job that happened to be deferred. So I feel like that duality where marking a job as deferred can provide you valuable insights and help with your data and program management. It doesn't get you stuck and unable to progress through the more traditional statuses. So I really think um, being able to have those very versatile capabilities is, is important. And there's the, there's the image again uh, of that swim lane. So us in Vermont, where our, our job process starts with coaching scheduled and it ends with invoiced. You know, it's very easy for me to picture a swim lane and all of these steps happen in the same order. It's very predictable. If anybody goes into the, the data management system, no matter what their job title or daily responsibilities are, and they say, oh, this job is audited or this job is in a work ordered status. They know what that means and they know what comes next because things always happen in the same order. Um, and that's where the notion of a deferred job or a deferral resolve job get a little bit funky. And, and I don't know whether it's appropriate to consider those as job statuses or not because they don't always happen in the same predictable order the way that all of the other job statuses do. So that, that's just sort of some food for thought that, that we've sort of wrestled with about, does it make sense to consider a job to be in a deferred status? Or would we rather know, no, this isn't an audited status, which means work order comes next, but it happens to be deferred. Um, so anyway, that, that may be splitting hairs, but it's just something that we've wrestled with a little bit. And I think there's probably a lot of productive ways to move through that potential challenge uh, to know whether these are job statuses or not. Is it, does anybody have any thoughts on that in the audience? I know the states that use Hancock, one state would like it a job status, one state would not. You know, it is a difference between the states. Like in your minds, is deferral a job status? And Josh, you you think it's not. It's just a status of a. So, so I guess I, I use this image of a pool with a swim lane uh, because to me, one, one way to think about it is that a deferral status is sort of a separate thing. It's over in another swim lane where a job may be working through the more familiar swim lane and all of a sudden it needs to to get out of that lane. It needs to go over into the other lane, which is specifically for deferral, where it's almost like, what is the deferral status of this job? It's not deferred, uh, it's currently deferred, uh, the deferral has been resolved. So I, I don't know, I could see it either way. I could see it being integrated into the existing swim lane, or I could see it treated separately. Um, I think that in our state, we're gonna really value the ability to go to that jobless grid and see the yes or no answers to the deferred and the deferral resolved um, question that's always going to give you a yes no answer and being able to see those various benchmark dates i think that um, we'll be able to get probably most of the information that we need right there off of that grid which julie from rhode island says could it be both so it kind of, yeah, it could, right? You could add it to your swim lane. It could be a status and you could collect detailed information about it for tracking. Right. Um, and then Andrea says, there are states that provide a time frame for, for, for deferral conditions to be fixed and the client could be moved back into an active job status. 
for those states, they might need to track it as a job status. If that time expired, for example, they may want to know that. Yeah, absolutely. And that could be more than one job status, like that time. You know, you could even use that deferral resolution date if that time for states that do that, Andrea. If that time expired, that could be, you know, deferral expired job status. And then the feedback is Pennsylvania does consider it a job status. Um, that's from one of the agencies in Pennsylvania. And then from the state in Pennsylvania, there's a comment. I think it's good to know the prior last status at the point it was deferred, which I think, Josh, aligns with what you're thinking right now, too. Um, yes, and I, and I think a lot of it, um, you know, I know we're going to we're going to transition to talking about readiness funds, which are just one potential way to remove a barrier to receiving comprehensive weatherization service. And I think as more and more financial resources come online to either prevent deferrals from occurring in the first place or ensuring that once a job is deferred, it is a very temporary thing, it's going to become more important to potentially have more terms to describe deferrals. And, and I think that's what we were sort of hinting at when we added deferral with path forward versus deferral with no path forward into our reasons list to at least give us a way to get a visual indicator on that. Because when there's no financial resources, a deferral really means a job is stationary and it's not gonna move again. It's been deferred and it's just gonna sit over there in the shallow end of the pool forever. Um, but as more financial resources become available to address those barriers, deferral may be a, a very short stop. Um, yeah, so, you know, if, if, gonna... if, we, if we have the ability to say this is a deferral with no path forward, then I could see that being a really viable job status. Deferring, it's going to be deferred. But if it's a deferral with a path forward, I think I'd rather know uh, was this audited or is it work ordered? You know, where where along the way was it in the traditional sense? Because we really think we're going to be able to keep this thing moving. Mm -hmm. Um, I just launched a poll if we all on the call because there's quite a bit I don't know if I don't think you guys can see each other but there's 75 of us here and we're probably all in the weatherization community so um so right now Josh can you see those poll results 75 percent think it, sh it is a separate status so it's but only now people are voting yeah so if you're just listening and not looking at the poll if you want to vote do you think deferral is a separate status or do you think the original status is plus tracking deferral would be a way for your state to go yeah. okay um i'm going to close that poll yeah thanks for thanks for doing it because uh i think it'll be important for for you to get a lot of uh, <laughs> diverse feedback from from folks to figure out what if anything more to do um you know to adjust the deferral tracking capabilities. I mean, right now, I just really want to extend our state's gratitude for everything that you've been um, willing to accommodate and able to accommodate quite well. So um, we can get all of this information that we consider quite valuable. So far, so good. Thanks. Okay, go ahead. Um, oops. So this was this was my cue to switch gears and talk about funding. I don't I don't have visuals up for it, but it, um, essentially we we have uh, you know a modest amount of weatherization readiness funds uh, from DOE, and um, we think that we're well positioned to be able to track that successfully through Hancock. Um, really, just expanding the processes that we had established for other non-federal funding sources that we had available and were fortunate to have available to remove barriers to moving on to regular weatherization work. Um, I, I know that we will likely treat readiness funds as a separate funding source, um, and that may not be the only way to track it through Hancock. Um, some might elect to treat it as like a budget line item. I don't know. 
Um, I know our plan is to treat it as a funding source because we see that it has a huge advantage of being able to utilize the full suite of your available reports um, if we treat it as a fund. Um, and if it processes through Hancock as a fund, it still is easy to insert into a DOE formatted report as a budget line um, within an overall grant report. So I, th I think that is our plan. And um, really it was, it was trying to figure out how are we gonna get the valuable information that we want about the full arc of deferrals um, that we felt was the bigger left than to figure out how do we track the funding of successful inter interventions in, in families' homes. Um, I would be curious to know if there are other Hancock states that have already um, started to process readiness funds through Hancock. Um, and, and if so, if you're, you're treating it as a funding source or if you're trying to do it a different way. I might have to call on some people. Um, Susan is from Georgia and I know they're kind of thinking through all of this right now. And Susan has been asking a lot of questions on the webinar. So Susan, do you have a microphone? I'm going to try to unmute you. Susan, do you have a mic? Do you have a microphone? Susan? She might not have a microphone. Um, I do know uh, Virginia, Josh, is they had initially thought it would be a new budget type, but then they decided to separate it as a whole different funding source for the reporting, um, for the measure restriction capability. So if weatherization readiness measures exceed weather, regular weatherization, then in the software, they won't be, you know, their agencies will have to use those measures only for weatherization. They can't use them for other unsupported funding sources. So I think that's why they did that. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that there very well may be advantages to doing it a different way. Um, but the way that we had done it in the past with other funds, um, whether they were a real funding source on paper or not, we treated them as a funding source in the, in the Hancock system because we were able to utilize the measure restrictions feature. There's value in that to us. And, and we were just able to utilize so many reports um, that are run by funding code. Um, so I know that in the past, um, for other things that were not federal flavor, um, but really they're basically the same thing as readiness funds. It worked really well to, to run it through the software in that way. But here's a different perspective, Scott. Do you mind if I unmute you and share what you're doing in Kansas? Go ahead, Scott. All right, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, we thought long and hard about going as a funding source and I set it up initially that way, kind of ran some of the different reports um, and realized that we needed to collect a little more information for what we think DOE is going to ask for uh, than what we had canned reports for. Uh, so we knew we were going to have to do some manual manipulation anyway. So we went ahead and just went with a budget line item because we do a lot of um, cash advances and uh, invoice tracking on our fiscal side through Hancock and with the Hancock reports and it was just going to be easier as a budget line item for us fiscally than um, than having that it as its own funding source so we went back and forth quite a while but we did end up on a budget uh, category interesting and then Julie in Rhode Island um, do you mind if you have a microphone I know you have a microphone no Julie ha added a comment that um, she set it up as a funding source. Yes, hi. Uh, oh, there you are. Go ahead. Hi, Danielle. Uh, yeah, and um, you had uh, were, were very helpful in um, walking me through that process. Ooh, when was that? Last week. But also, um, you know, being able to uh, to use the measure restriction feature was uh, was important so we will identify measures put the prefix as weatherization readiness and and be able to restrict um, you know the agencies uh, selecting those measures for weatherization readiness only so that was our primary focus and that in the reporting aspect as well mm-hmm 
And then um, Andrea, do you want to, Andrea has a comment in general about weatherization readiness. And I'm going to unmute you, Andrea. Andrea, do you have a microphone? Of course you do. I think so. I, yeah. If you can hear me. Yeah, I was just going to mention one thing in that, you know, the weatherization readiness fund, since they were part of the PY 2022 formula awards, it can't be mingled with the new DOE bill fund. So just kind of, you know, keep that in mind as you're setting them up. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that I, I could definitely see the advantages that Scott is talking about. I think it really just depends on your operational model and how you, how you integrate your your financial and payroll and accounting systems with with the information in Hancock. Um, and there's just a lot of nuance involved. And um, I could I could see where depending on the model employed at any given state, it may make more sense to do it as a funding source or, or do it as a budget line um, under the umbrella of an already existing funding source. But I, th I think the, the main takeaway is it's really not that big of a lift at the end of the day. And, and I think that the current capabilities of Hancock more than more than have us all covered uh, whatever path we choose to, to pursue. Yeah, and it's nice that you have the option to go either way. Okay, is Josh, do you have more? I, I don't have any more um, prepared, um, but I would be happy to to be a part of a conversation to the extent folks on the call want to have one. Does anybody have, you know, there are some, there was a question about weatherization readiness. Are you going to fund these deferrals with the past path forward with weatherization readiness funding? If you are, you're going to weatherize them later, would you use DOE funding? And I know that answer might be different for your state, but go ahead. Uh, so the, the answer to will we use weatherization readiness funds is a is a maybe. Um, I think that 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 is one of the funds in the prevent deferrals funding portfolio that we've been able to grow over the last few years. So um, it, it's something that we're considering as a, as a maybe. And if that maybe turns to yes for any given job, then we would just want to make sure that we were in compliance with the, the guidance that was issued via the readiness uh, WPN. Um, I, I think that the thing that we're really going to have to pay the most attention to, in addition to just ensuring that if readiness funds are used, that the regular weatherization job itself then moves on to, to be DOE funded, is that it has to be completed from start to finish, including the, the intervention with the readiness funds, um, all in the same DOE program year. So we see that time constraint as probably the biggest barrier where, you know, if, if we're able to compile, you know, all of our resources and prevent 50 deferrals and the DOE funds you know, go toward 10 of that, then we're really going to have to be careful about which 10 we fund with readiness funds to make sure that the whole project can come to fruition within the same DOE program year um, that the readiness funds were used. That, that's kind of a weird nuance that they layered into the, the readiness funding guidance. Mm -hmm. And the software features that Josh showed today, um, they're available for any state because they're in every, the, we have two branches of the software, they're in both of it. So you can talk to the support desk about upgrading to that version. But Andrea was asking like, do any other states have a deferral module now? That's a hard question for me to answer. Everybody tracks deferrals in Hancock. Some states, move forward with deferrals. Josh, like you do this today, don't you defer a job, but you have certain funding sources that support doing something in that house? Yes. So you you have been, been doing this, right? Yep. Yeah, so I think some states do that. Um, some states, you know, when it's deferred, that is a stopping point for that job until the deferral is resolved. But if you want these features, you're going to get them. 
Um, if you want them sooner rather, rather than later, have your state reach out to the support desk, our support, and we can get an upgrade scheduled. Okay. Anybody, like, you can raise your hand if you want me to unmute you. I don't see any other written questions. Josh, this is great. Your house is still standing. No tornado. You gave a great webinar. And you answered a lot of questions. <laughs> Josh, I think we lost Josh. Um, Maybe we spoke too soon. We spoke too soon. No. So brief. Oh. Okay. Well, I'll end the webinar and I'm gonna call Josh on the phone to make sure he's okay. okay. All right. I'll <laughs> send. <you> <laughs> I'll send everybody the recording. Thanks. Bye. Bye.